Hello. In this video, I want to continue our exploration of calculating dynamic properties from molecular dynamics simulations. This discussion was started in my video on the autocorrelation function, but now I want to extend it by explaining how to calculate the vibrational density of states. Before we get onto that, however, let's recap the ideas about the autocorrelation function that I introduced in the last video. In that last video, I explained that static properties tell you about the properties of the macrostates. When you calculate these static properties, you are probing the distribution of macrostates that we have learned, about, learned emerges from statistical mechanics. This distribution tells us that certain fixed that there, this, this distribution tells us that we have certain fixed likelihoods for visiting each of the accessible microstates. When we calculate static properties, we are thus determining these fixed the effect that these fixed probabilities have on the average values for the observables that we measure from experiments. Dynamic properties, by contrast, tell us about the average correlations between the instantaneous values of microscopic properties. In other words, they tell us how long we might expect the system to persist in a particular behaviour. The only dynamic property we introduced in the last video and in the exercises was the velocity autocorrelation function, which was given by the expression shown here. This function measures the average of the dot product between the velocities at time t and at time t plus delta later, as this equation makes clear. In my last video, I explained that the, the autocorrelation function for solid materials will often look like the graph shown here. Solid materials display correlations over long timescales because the, the atoms in solids oscillate along particular directions and vibrate around their lattice sites. In other words, the atoms in solids undergo collective and correlated motion. By contrast, the velocity autocorrelation function for a liquid might look something like this. There is no evidence of long timescale correlation for the atoms in a liquid as the particles to are free to diffuse around freely as the cartoon with the red atom here shows. Having recapped the theory of the autocorrelation function, we can now move to, move to the new theory that I would like to introduce in this video. To motivate the ideas that I would like to introduce here, I would like you to think of, look at the example autocorrelation function that I have drawn on this slide. This function perhaps looks pretty complicated. It is actually rather simple, however. I constructed it by taking a linear combination of the three functions that have just appeared on the left of the slide. The particular linear combination of these functions that I took is indicated at the top of the slide. Notice that the terms in this expression all contain a coefficient, the 0 0.2, 0 0.5 and the 4, which is multiplied by an exponential decay, e to the minus 0.3x, which is in turn multiplied by a periodic function. The only difference, other than the coefficient between these three functions, is the period of the cosine function. Elsewhere in your maths degree, you have probably encountered the Fourier series. When you were taught this topic, the fact that you can represent all periodic functions as a suitable linear combination of sine functions and cosine functions was almost certainly explained. You probably also learned that you can represent periodic functions in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. When you represent the functions in this domain, you can provide information on the coefficients of all the cosine and sine functions that were used to construct the original periodic function. The periodic part of the function at the top of the slide would thus have a peak at a frequency of 1, a peak at a frequency of 5, and a peak at a frequency of 9. Furthermore, these peaks would have heights of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 4 respectively. We cannot represent the function that I've shown on this slide using a Fourier series, as multiplying by the decaying exponential ensures that it is not periodic. This function is not periodic. We can, however, transform the function from the time domain to the frequency domain by taking its Fourier transform as shown here. 
When you do this, you see that there are peaks at 1, 5 and 9 that arise because the function is constructed from these three periodic functions. The peaks in this Fourier transform are broadened because we have to take in the product with the exponential. However, the peaks clearly indicate that the system is undergoing three distinct damped and periodic motions. If we were to take similar Fourier transforms of the autocorrelation functions that emerge from our MD simulations, we may therefore use them to identify the damped periodic motions that these systems undergo. In the rest of this video, we are thus going to learn how to calculate the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function in order to arrive at the so-called vibrational density of states. You may at this stage be thinking that that's, this sounds pretty easy. All you need to do is run an NVE simulation, compute the autocorrelation function from that simulation using the ideas that I explained in my previous video, and then Fourier transform the results. Furthermore, if you're really on the ball, you're probably thinking that someone must have written a library in Python for computing Fourier transforms. All you need to do in the rest of this video is thus point you in the direction of that library and you will be on your way. Now, while that approach would work in practice, in, in, it would work, it is not what we actually do in practice. To be honest, a real expert in molecular dynamics simulation wouldn't even compute the autocorrelation function in the way I showed you in the last video. The algorithm I taught you in that video, video helps you to understand what the autocorrelation function measures. It is, however, computationally expensive to compute. It turns out that we can exploit the properties of Fourier transforms to compute the autocorrelation function much more quickly. I am thus going to explain this alternative approach here. The first step in this alternative approach is to take the Fourier transform of the time series of velocities. You do this using the, Python for using the formula shown here, but in practice, and as you will see on the next slide, you use a Python library for this step. It probably seems odd to start by computing the Fourier transform of the time series of velocities. After all, the final quant we want is the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function. We would compute this Fourier transform using the formula shown here. When this expression is compared with the expression for v hat, you see that the t in the expression for v hat has been replaced by tau, the time that has elapsed between our two measurements of the velocity. Computing the Fourier transform of the time series of velocities thus seems like a very odd thing to do. We are helped once we remember that the autocorrelation function is computed using this formula. The sum over t of the product of two this sum over t of the product of two functions is an example of what is called a convolution. The fact that the autocorrelation function is a convolution is useful to know because of a result in the theory of Fourier transforms called the convolution theorem. This result tells us that the Fourier transform of a convolution is equal to the element-wise product of the Fourier transforms of the two functions that are being convolved. In other words, we can compute the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function using the formula shown here. In this formula, we are using the Fourier transforms of the time series of velocities. And these are the only things that appear in the right-hand side of the expression. The procedure that we will adopt to calculate the vibrational density of states, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, is as follows. We will first run an NVE simulation. We will then Fourier transform the time series of velocities that we get from that simulation. We then compute the mean of the element-wise product of the Fourier transforms of the time series of velocities to arrive at our final estimate for the vibrational density of states. 
Notice furthermore that if you ever need to compute the autocorrelation function again, you can forget about the old code that I taught you in the previous video. An expert would follow these first three steps that are shown in blue to compute the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. They would then get the final autocorrelation function by doing an inverse Fourier transform on the vibrational density of states. Let's now look at the Python code for computing the vibrational states, density of states, using this method. The full code for doing this is shown on this slide. The first part of this code here transfers the time series of velocities that we got from molecular dynamics that was run with ASE to a matrix with three times the number of atoms, rows, and a number of columns that is equal to the length of the trajectory. The loop in this code sets the columns of this matrix equal to the velocities at each time slice. By the time we arrive at the command that sets FF tranche, we have thus set the matrix V tranche in a way that ensures that we can follow how the components of the velocity of each atom change with time by moving along one chosen row of the matrix. In other words, row 5 of the matrix V tranche contains the time series of velocities for the Z component of atom 2. This line that sets FF tranche is the one that does the Fourier transform of the time series of velocities. Furthermore, the output from this command, FF tranche, is still a matrix. The rows of this matrix contain the Fourier transforms of the time series for each component of the velocity. In other words, element 4 of this matrix contains the Fourier transforms of the time series of the Y components of the velocity for atom 2. The multiplication here, the FF tranche times NP conjugate FF tranche, performs the element-wise product of these two matrices of Fourier transforms. The result of this element-wise multiplication is still a matrix. Furthermore, it is important to reiterate here that we are not doing matrix multiplication when we do FF tranche times NP conjugate FF tranche. We are instead constructing a new matrix that has the same number of rows and columns as FF tranche. The IJ element of this new matrix is computed by taking the IJ element of FF tranche and multiplying it by the complex conjugate of the IJ element of FF tranche. There is no summing as there would be in matrix multiplication. The final vibrational density of states is not a matrix, it is a function, and we will thus need to convert this matrix to a vector. In this code, we make this conversion by averaging over all the components of the velocity of the atoms as shown here. We can average over all the atoms and all the components of the atoms here because all the components of the velocity should be identical. All the atoms have the same type, so we would expect every component of the velocity of every atom to have the same vibrational density of states. Each component of each atom is giving us a separate estimate of the vibrational density of states, and these are the things that we are averaging. All that is left to do is plot the final results. We are helped in this regard as the Python library that we have used to, for the Fourier transform also provides us with a function that tells us the frequencies at which the Fourier transform has been evaluated. We can thus use the method rffttfreq, as shown here, to get the x values at which to plot the y values in fdos. We just need to provide this function with information on the time between each output of the velocity that was in our simulation.
When we run the code on the last slide, we arrive at an estimate for the vibrational density of states that looks something like this. This is what the vibrational density of states looks like for a solid. You will see that there are some peaks in this function that indicates that the atoms undergo motions with certain characteristic frequencies. When we compute the vibrational density of states for a liquid, you do not see these peaks anymore. There is much less evidence of correlated motion for the atoms in a liquid. The other difference that you may notice between the two vibrational density of state plots here concerns the behavior for zero frequency. The value for the vibrational density states at, a, at zero frequency is important as it tells us something about the diffusion constant in the material. If you look at the two plots here, you can see that for the solid, there is no diffusion because the vibrational density of states at zero frequency is zero. For the liquid, by contrast, there is some diffusion as the vibrational density states of states at frequency equal to zero has a finite positive value. So there you go. That should be enough information about the vibrational density of states for you to get started on the final exercises. If you've got to the end of this and all the other videos, it should also be enough information for you to complete the last of these assignments for MTH4332. I hope you feel that these assignments have given you a good introduction to the basics of molecular dynamic simulations. Obviously, there is a lot that we haven't been able to cover and other techniques are constantly being developed. If at the end of this course, you have understood how to compute free energy surfaces, the radial distribution functions and vibrational density of states, then you have done really well. This is an extremely good basis for a PhD that involves running these types of simulation. Thanks for your attention and good luck with whatever comes next.